negative signs? Or what are no signs by which we are to judge of a work? And especially what are no evidences that a work is not from the Spirit of God? First, nothing can be certainly concluded from this that a work is carried on in a way very unusual and extraordinary, provided the variety or difference be such as may still be comprehended within the limits of Scripture rules. What the Church has been used to is not a rule by which we are to judge, because there may be new and extraordinary works of God, and He is heretofore evidently wrought in an extraordinary manner. He has brought to pass new things, strange works, and has wrought in such a manner as to surprise both men and angels. And as God has done thus in times past, so we have no reason to think but that He will do so still. The prophecies of Scripture give us reason to think that God hath things to accomplish which have never yet been seen. No deviation from what has hitherto been usual, let it be never so great, is an argument that a work is not from the Spirit of God, if it be no deviation from His prescribed rule. The Holy Spirit is sovereign in this operation, and we know that He uses a great variety. And we cannot tell how great a variety He may use within the compass of the rules He Himself has fixed. We ought not to limit God where he has not limited himself. Therefore, it is not reasonable to determine that a work is not from God's Holy Spirit because of the extraordinary degree in which the minds of persons are influenced. If they seem to have an extraordinary conviction of the dreadful nature of sin and a very uncommon sense of the misery of a Christless condition, or extraordinary views as a certainty and glory of divine things, and are proportionably moved with very extraordinary affections of fear and sorrow, desire, love, or joy, or if the apparent change be very sudden and the work be carried on with very unusual swiftness, and the persons affected are very numerous, and many of them are very young, with other unusual circumstances not infringing upon scripture marks of a work of the Spirit, these things are no argument that the work is not of the Spirit of God. The extraordinary and unusual degree of influence and power of operation, if in its nature it be agreeable to the rules and marks given in scripture, is rather an argument in its favor. For by how much higher the degree in which its nature is agreeable to the rule, so much the more is there of conformity to the rule, and so much the more evident that conformity. When things are in small degrees, though they be really agreeable to the rule, it is not so easily seen whether their nature agrees with the rule. There is a great aptness in persons to doubt of things that are strange, especially elderly persons, to think that to be right, which they have never been used to in their day, and have not heard of in the days of their fathers. But if it be a good argument that the work is not from the Spirit of God, that it is very unusual, then it was so in the Apostles' days. The work of the Spirit then was carried on in a manner that, in very many respects, was altogether new, such as never had been seen or heard since the world stood. The work was then carried on with more visible and remarkable power than ever, nor had there been seen before such mighty and wonderful effects of the Spirit of God in sudden changes, in such great engagingness and sale of great multitudes, such a sudden alteration in towns, cities, and countries, such a swift progress and vast extent of the work, and many other extraordinary circumstances might be mentioned. The great unusualness of the work surprised the Jews. They knew not what to make of it, but could not believe it to be the work of God. Many looked upon the persons that were the subjects of it as bereft of reason, as you may see in Acts 2, verse 13, Acts 26, 24, and 1 Corinthians 4, 10. And we have reason from Scripture prophecy to suppose that at the commencement of the last and great outpouring of the Spirit of God, that is to be in the latter ages of the world, the manner of the work will be very extraordinary, and such as has never yet been seen, 
so that there shall be occasion then to say, as in Isaiah 66, verse 8, Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall the nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. It may be reasonably expected that the extraordinary manner of the work then will bear some proportion to the very extraordinary events and a glorious change in the state of the world which God will bring to pass by it. Number 2. A work is not to be judged of by any effects on the bodies of men, such as tears, trembling, groans, loud outcries, agonies of the body, or the felling of bodily strength. The influence persons are under is not to be judged of one way or other by such effects on the body, and the reason is because the scripture nowhere gives us any such rule. We cannot conclude that persons are under the influence of the true spirit because we see such effects upon their bodies, because this is not given as a mark of the true spirit. Nor, on the other hand, have we any reason to conclude from any such outward appearances that persons are not under the influence of the spirit of God, because there is no rule of scripture given us to judge of spirits by that does either expressly or indirectly exclude such effects on the body nor does reason exclude them. It is easily accounted for from the consideration of the nature of divine and eternal things, and the nature of man, and the laws of union between soul and body, how a right influence, a true and proper sense of things, should have such effects on the body, even those that are of the most extraordinary kind, such as taking away the bodily strength or throwing the body into great agonies and extorting loud outcries. There is none of us but do suppose, and would have been ready at the time to say it, that the misery of hell is doubtless so dreadful and eternity so vast, that if a person should have a clear apprehension of that misery as it is, it would be more than his feeble frame could bear. And especially if at the same time he saw himself in great, danger of it, and to be utterly uncertain whether he should be delivered from it, yea, and to have no security from it one day or hour. If we consider human nature, we must not wonder that when persons have a great sense of that which is so amazingly dreadful, and also have a great view of their own wickedness and God's anger, the thing seemed to them to forebode speedy and immediate destruction. We see the nature of man to be such that when he is in danger of some terrible calamity which he is greatly exposed to, he is ready upon every occasion to think that now it is coming. When persons' hearts are full of fear in time of war, they are ready to tremble at the shaking of a leaf and to expect the enemy every minute, and to say within themselves, Now I shall be slain. If we suppose that a person saw himself hanging over a great pit, full of fierce and glowing flames, by a thread that he knew to be very weak, and not sufficient to bear his weight, and knew that multitudes had been in such circumstances before, and that most of them had fallen and perished, and saw nothing within reach that he could take hold of to save him. What distress would he be in? How ready to think that now the thread was breaking, that now this minute he should be swallowed up in those dreadful flames. And would he not be ready to cry out in such circumstances? How much more of those that see themselves in this manner hanging over an infinitely more dreadful pit? or held over it in the hands of God, who at the same time they see to be exceedingly provoked. No wonder that the wrath of God, when manifested but a little to the soul, overbears human strength. So it may easily be accounted for that a true sense of the glorious excellency of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of his wonderful dying love, and the exercise of a truly spiritual love and joy should be such as very much to overcome the bodily strength. We are all already to own that no man can see God and live, and as 
but a very small part of that apprehension of the glory and love of Christ which the saints enjoy in heaven, that our present frame can bear. Therefore, it is not at all strange that God should sometimes give his saints such foretaste of heaven as to diminish their bodily strength. If it was not on the carnival that the Queen of Sheba fainted, and her bodily strength taken away when she came to see the glory of Solomon, much less is it on the carnival that she, who is the antipipe of the Queen of Sheba, the church, it is brought, as it were, from the utmost ends of the earth, from being an alien and stranger far off in a state of sin and misery, should faint when she comes to see the glory of Christ who is the antitype of Solomon, and especially will be so in that prosperous, peaceful, glorious kingdom which he will set up in the world in his latter age. Some object against such extraordinary appearances that we have no instance of them in the recorded New Testament, under the extraordinary effusions of the Spirit, were this allowed, I can see no force in the objection. If neither reason nor any rule of scripture excludes such things, especially consider what was observed under the foregoing particular. I do not know that we have any express mention in the New Testament of any person's weeping or groaning or sighing through fear of hell or a sense of God's anger. But is there anybody so foolish as from hence to argue that in whomsoever the things appear the convictions are not? from the Spirit of God. And the reason why we do not argue thus is because these are easily accounted for. From what we know of the nature of man and from what the scriptures inform us in general concerning the nature of eternal things and the nature of the convictions of God's Spirit, so that there is no need that anything should be said in particular concerning these external circumstantial effects. Nobody supposes that there is any need of express scripture for every external, accidental manifestation of the inward motion of the mind. And though such circumstances are not particularly recorded in sacred history, yet there is a great deal of reason to think, from the general accounts we have, that it could not be otherwise than that such things must be in those days. And there is also reason to think that such great outpouring of the Spirit was not wholly without those more extraordinary effects on a person's bodies. The jailer in particular seems to have been an instance of that nature, when he in the utmost distress and amazement came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. His falling down at that time does not seem to be a design putting himself into a posture of supplication her humble address to Paul and Silas, for he doesn't seem to have said anything to them then. But he first brought them out, and then he says to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? But his falling down seems to be from the same cause as his trembling. The psalmist gives an account of his crying out loud and a great weakening of his body under convictions of conscience and a sense of the guilt of sin. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. We may at least argue so much from it that such an effect of conviction of sin may well in some cases be supposed. For if we should suppose anything of an octasis in the expressions, yet... The psalmist would not represent his case by what would be absurd, and to which no degree of that exercise of his mind be spoke of, would have any tendency. We read of in the disciples in Matthew 14.26 that when they saw Christ come into them in the storm, and took him for some terrible enemy threatening their destruction in that storm, they cried out for fear. Why then should it be thought strange that persons should cry out for fear when God appears to them as a terrible enemy, and as they see themselves in great danger of being swallowed up in the bottomless gulf of eternal misery? The spouse once and again speaks of herself as overpowered with the love of Christ, so as to weaken her body and make her faint. Saga Solomon 2.5 in chapter 5, verse 8, I charge you, O you daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick, 
of love, from whence may at least argue that such an effect may well be supposed to arise from such a cause in the saints in some cases, and that such an effect will sometimes be seen in the church of Christ. It is a weak objection that the impressions of enthusiasts have a great effect on their bodies, that the Quakers used to tremble, is no argument that Saul, afterwards Paul, and the jailer did not tremble from real convictions of conscience. Indeed, all such objections from effects on the body, let them be greater or less, seem to be exceeding frivolous. They who argue thence proceed in the dark. They know not what ground they go upon, nor by what rule they judge. The root and course of things is to be looked at, and the nature of the operations and affections are to be inquired into, and examined by the rule of God's word, and not the motions of the blood and animal spirits. Number three, it is no argument that an operation on the minds of people is not to work at the Spirit of God, that it occasions a great deal of noise about religion. For though true religion be on a contrary nature to that of the Pharisees, which was ostentation, and delighted to set itself forth to the view of men for their applause. Yet such is human nature that it is morally impossible that there should be a great concern, strong affection, and a general engagingness of mind amongst the people without causing a notable, visible, and open commotion and alteration amongst that people. Surely it is no argument that the minds of persons are not under the influence of God's Spirit, that they are very much moved. For indeed spiritual and eternal things are so great and of such infinite concern that there is a great absurdity in men's being, but moderately moved and affected by them. And surely it is no argument that they are not moved by the Spirit of God, that they are affected with the things in some measure as they deserve, or in some proportion to their importance. And when was there ever any such thing since the world stood as the people in general being greatly affected in any affair whatsoever without noise or stir? The nature of man will not allow it. Indeed, Christ says in Luke 17, verse 20, The kingdom of God comes not with observation. That is, it will not consist in what is outward and visible. It shall not be like earthly kingdoms set up with outward pomp in some particular place, which shall be especially the royal city and the seat of the kingdom, as Christ explains himself in the words next following. Neither shall they say, Lo here and lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Not that the kingdom of God shall be set up in the world, on the ruin of Satan's kingdom, without a very observable great effect a mighty change in the state of things, to the observation and astonishment of the whole world, for such an effect as this is even held forth in the prophecies of Scripture, and is so by Christ himself in this very place, and even in his own explanation of these forementioned words, verse 24, for as the lightning that lighteneth out one part under heaven shines unto another part under heaven, so also so the Son of Man be in his day. This is to distinguish Christ's coming to set up its kingdom from the coming of the false Christ, which he tells us will be in a he tells us will be in a private manner in the deserts and in the secret chambers, whereas this event of setting up the kingdom of God should be open in public, in the sight of the whole world, with clear manifestation like lightning that cannot be hid, but glares in everyone's eyes. It shines from one side of heaven to the other. And we find that when Christ's kingdom came by that remarkable pouring out of the Spirit in the Apostles' days, it occasioned a great stir everywhere. What a mighty opposition was there in Jerusalem on occasion of the great effusion of the Spirit. And so in Samaria, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, and other places, the affair filled the world with noise and gave occasion to some to say of the apostles that they had turned the world upside down. Acts 17, verse 6. Number 4. It is no argument in an operation on the minds of a people is not the work of the Spirit of God. The many who are the subjects of it have great impressions made on their imaginations. That persons have many impressions on their imaginations does not prove that they have nothing else. It is easy to be accounted for that there should be much of this nature amongst the people where a great multitude of all kinds of constitutions have their minds engaged with intense thought 
and strong affections about invisible things. Yea, it would be strange if there should not be such. Such is our nature that we cannot think of things invisible without a degree of imagination. I dare appeal to any man of the greatest powers of mind whether he is able to fix his thoughts on God or Christ or the things of another world without imaginary ideas attending his meditations. And the more engaged a mind is and the more intense a contemplation and affection, still the more lively and strong the imaginary idea will ordinarily be especially when attended with surprise. And this is the case when the mental prospect is very new and takes strong hold of the passions as fear or joy. And when the change of the state of views of the mind is sudden, from a contrary extreme is from that which was extremely dreadful to that which is extremely ravishing and delightful. And it is no wonder that many persons do not well distinguish between that which is imaginary and that which is intellectual and spiritual, and that they are apt to lay too much weight on the imaginary part, and are most ready to speak of that in the account they give of their experiences, especially persons of less understanding of a distinguishing capacity. As God has given us such a faculty as the imagination, and so made us that we cannot think of things spiritual and invisible without some exercise of this faculty. So it appears to me that such is our state in nature, that this faculty is really subservient and helpful to the other faculties of the mind, when a proper use is made of it. Though oftentimes when the imagination is too strong and the other faculties weak, it overbears and disturbs them in their exercise. It appears to me manifest in many instances with which I have been acquainted, that God has really made use of this faculty to truly divine purposes especially in some that are more ignorant. God seems to condescend to their circumstances and deal with them as babes, as of old he instructed his church, while in a state of ignorance and minority by types and outward representations. I can see nothing unreasonable in such a position. Let others have much occasion to deal with souls and spiritual concerns judge whether experience does not confirm it. It is no argument that a work is not of the Spirit of God that some who are the subjects of it have been in a kind of ecstasy wherein they have been carried beyond themselves and have had their minds transported into a train of strong and pleasing imaginations and a kind of visions as though they were wrapped up even to heaven and there saw glorious sights. I've been acquainted with some such instances, and I see no need of bringing in the help of the devil into the account. We have of they things, nor yet of supposing them to be of the same nature with the visions of the prophets or Paul's rapture in a paradise. Human nature under these intense exercises and affections is all that need be brought into the account. If it may be well accounted for that persons under a true sense of the glorious and wonderful greatness and excellency of divine things, and so ravishing views of the beauty and love of Christ, should have the strength of nature overpowered, as I have already shown that it may, then I think it is not at all strange that amongst great numbers that are thus affected and overborne, there should be some persons of particular constitution should should have their imaginations thus affected. The effect is no other than what bears a proportion and an analogy to other effects of the strong exercise of their minds. It is no wonder when the thoughts are so fixed, and the affection so strong, and the whole soul so engaged, ravished, and swallowed up, that all other parts of the body are so affected as to be deprived of their strength, and the whole frame ready to dissolve. Is it any wonder that, in such a case, a brain in particular, especially in some constitutions, which we know is most especially affected by intense contemplations and exercises of mind, should be so affected that his strength and spirits should for a season be diverted and taken off from impressions made on the organs of external sense and be wholly employed in a train of pleasing delightful imaginations corresponding with the present frame of the mind. Some are ready to interpret such things wrong and to lay too much weight on them as prophetical visions, divine revelations, some sometimes significations from heaven of what shall come to pass which the issue in some instances I have known, has shown to be otherwise. But yet, 
It appears to me that such things are evidently sometimes from the Spirit of God, though indirectly. That is, their extraordinary frame of mind and that strong and lively sense of divine things which is the occasion of them is from His Spirit. And also the mind continues in its holy frame and retains a divine sense of the excellency of spiritual things, even in its rapture, which holy frame and sense is from the Spirit of God, though the imaginations that attend it are but accidental, and therefore there is commonly something or other in them that is confused and proper and false. Number five. It is no sign that a work is not from the Spirit of God, that example is a great means of it. It surely is no argument that an effect is not from God that means are used in producing it. For we know that it is God's manner to make use of means in carrying on his work in the world. And it is no more an argument it's against the divinity of an effect that this means is made use of than it was by any other means. It is agreeable to scripture. The person should be influenced by one another's good example. The scripture directs to us to set good examples to that end, Matthew 5, 16, 1 Peter 3, 1, and so on, and also directs us to be influenced by the good examples of others and to follow them, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 7, Hebrews 4, 12. And by which it appears that example is one of God's means, and certainly it is no argument that a work is not of God, that its own means are made use of to effect it. And as it is a scriptural way of carrying on God's word by example, so it is a reasonable way. It is no argument that men are not influenced by reason, that they are influenced by example. This way of persons holding forth truth to one another has a tendency to enlighten the mind and to convince reason. None will deny but that for persons to signify things one to another by words may rationally be supposed to tend to enlighten each other's minds. But the same thing may be signified by actions, and signified much more fully and effectually. Words are of no use any otherwise than as they convey our own ideas to others, but actions in some cases may do it much more fully. There is a language in actions, and in some cases much more clear and convincing than in words. It is therefore no argument against the goodness of the effect that persons are greatly affected by seeing others so, yea, through the impression be made only by seeing the tokens of great and extraordinary affections in others and their behavior, taken for granted what they are affected with without hearing them say one word. Well, a footnote here, I would say that if Edwards knew more about the doctrine of sympathy, like, for example, in the discussions of uh, Robert Louis Dabney in his uh, article called um, Spurious Religious Excitements. And so we judge everything by the scriptures. But to return to Edwards, there may be language sufficient in such a case in their behavior only to convey their minds to others and to signify to them their sense of things more than can possibly be done by words only. If a person should see another under extreme bodily torment, he might receive much clearer ideas and more convincing evidence of what he suffered by his actions and his misery than he could do only by the words of an unaffected, indifferent relator. In like manner, he may receive a greater idea of anything that is excellent and very delightful from the behavior of one that is in actual enjoyment than by the dull narration of one which is in experience and insensible himself. The desire that the manner may be examined by the strictest reason. It is not manifest that effects produced in persons' minds are rational, since not only weak and ignorant people are much influenced by example, but also those that make the greatest boast the strength of reason are more influenced by reason held forth in this way than almost any other way. Indeed, the religious affections of many when raised by this means, as by hearing the word preached and any other means, may prove flashy and soon vanish, as Christ represents a stony ground hearers. But the affections of some thus move by example or abiding and prove to be of a saving issue. There never yet was a time of remarkable pouring out of the Spirit and a great revival of religion, but that example had a main hand. So it was at the Reformation and in the Apostles' days in Jerusalem and Samaria and Ephesus and other parts of the world. 
This will be most manifest to anyone that attends to the accounts we have in the Acts of the Apostles. It's in those days one person was moved by another, so one city or town was influenced by the example of another, so that you were in samples to all the belief in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad. It is no valid objection against examples being so much used that the scripture speaks of the word as the principal means of carrying on God's work. For the word of God is the principal means, nevertheless, by which other means operate and are made effectual. Even the sacraments have no effect, but by the word. And so it is that example becomes effectual, for all that is visible to the eye is unintelligible and vain, without the word of God to entrust and guide the mind. It is the word of God that is indeed held forth and applied by example as the word of God, Lord, sounded forth to other towns of Macedonia and Achaia, by the example of those that believed in Thessalonica. That example should be a great means of propagating the church of God seems to be several ways signified in Scripture. It is signified by Ruth following Naomi onto the land of Moab, into the land of Israel, when she resolved that she would not leave her but would go where she went, and would lodge where she lodged, and that Naomi's people should be her people, and Naomi's God, her God, Ruth, who is the ancestral mother of David and of Christ was undoubtedly a great type of the church, upon which account her history is inserted in the canon of Scripture, and her leaving the land of Moab and its gods, to come to put her trust under the shadow of the wings of the God of Israel. We have a type of the conversion not only of the Gentile church, but of every sinner, that is naturally an alien and a stranger. Number six, it is no sign that a work is not from the Spirit of God at many, who seem to be the subjects of it, are guilty of great imprudences and irregularities in their conduct. We are to consider that the end for which God pours out his spirit is to make men holy, and not to make them politicians. Is it no wonder that, in a mixed multitude of all sorts, wise and unwise, young and old, of weak and strong natural abilities, under strong impressions of mind, there are many who behave themselves imprudently? There are but few that know how to conduct themselves under vehement affections of any kind, whether of a temporal, spiritual nature. To do so requires a great deal of discretion, strength, and steadiness of mind. A thousand imprudences will not prove a work to be not of the Spirit of God, if there be not only imprudences, but many things prevailing that are irregular, and really contrary to the rule of God's holy word, that it should be thus may well be accounted for from the exceeding weakness of human nature, together with the remaining darkness and corruption of those that are yet the subjects of the saving influences of God's Spirit, and have a real zeal for God. We have a remarkable instance in the New Testament of a people that partook largely of that great effusion of the Spirit in the Apostles' days, among whom there were nevertheless abounded imprudences and great irregularities and so on. The church at Corinth. There is scarcely any church more celebrated in the New Testament for being blessed with large measures of the Spirit of God, both in its ordinary influences and in convincing and converting sinners, and also in its extraordinary and miraculous gifts. Yet what manifold imprudences, great and sinful irregularities, and strange confusion did they run into at the Lord's Supper, and in the exercise of church discipline, to which may be added their indecent manner of attending other parts of public worship, their jarring and contention about their teachers, and even the exercise of their extraordinary gifts of prophecy, speaking with tongues and the light, and they spake and acted by the immediate inspiration of the Spirit of God. And if we see great imprudences and even sinful irregularities in some who are great instruments to carry on the work, it will not prove it not to be the work of God. The Apostle Peter himself, who was a great, eminently holy and inspired apostle, and one of the chief instruments of setting up the Christian church in the world, when he was actually engaged in this work, was guilty of a great sinful error in his conduct of which the Apostle speaks in Galatians 2, 11 to 13. 
But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, and so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. If a great pillar of the Christian church, one of the chief of those who are the very foundations on which next to Christ the whole church is said to be built, was guilty of such an irregularity, is it any wonder if other lesser instruments who have not that extraordinary conduct of the divine spirit he had to be guilty of many irregularities?